Hi, this is Jaron Lanier. I am the author of the audiobook, Who Owns the Future? I'm what's considered an old guy in Silicon Valley. I'm 53, and it just doesn't seem that old to me. But it does mean that I got to participate in the birth of the internet. I got to be the chief scientist of the Engineering Office of Internet 2, which was the big academic consortium. And for years, we had looked forward to how the internet would bring about an increase in wealth and well-being for people. I in particular thought that my musical friends would do great once we were freed from the shackles of the labels, as we used to put it. But the thing that got to me around the turn of the century is I wasn't seeing the results we expected. We were still talking the same line, but... What was actually happening is there was an incredible increase in income inequality in the U.S. The middle classes were suffering and there was a loss of social mobility, exactly the opposite. And so I set out to discover what had gone wrong. That is what motivated me to write this book. Well, the way it's changing the economy right now is complicated. There's two primary stories. One of the stories is about those industries that were kind of about information alone, like the media industries, journalism and music, for instance. And those have just been decimated by the internet, which means that they're losing nine-tenths of their value. And that's not what was supposed to happen, but it's the way things turned out. But the bigger picture is the one that I'm more worried about. What I'm really worried about is that there's a new pattern that's emerged where whoever has access to the most effective or biggest computer online can use it to calculate some kind of advantage over everybody else, even if other people have access to the same information. And what that's leading to is this pattern of astounding wealth concentration around the most important computers and power concentration. So in my view, something like a Facebook is not all that different from something like an NSA. Uh, they're both examples of giant computers that people have learned to use to increase their power. They're like the new oil fields of the information age. Now, we could survive that if no other industries were going to be decimated in the way that the media industries are already being decimated, but that's not the way it's going to be. Other technologies coming down the pike include 3D printers, which could provide an alternate way to get products, which could threaten both factories and retail. We also will look at new advances in medicine, advances in robotics, self-driving vehicles. Essentially, the jobs will start going away because the machines will finally get good enough. And when that happens, we have a choice. Do we decide that people are obsolete or that we should turn to some sort of socialist solution where committees decide who's worthy of being supported even though there aren't jobs for them? Or can we find another solution that more honestly reflects where digital value really comes from, which is from people? What I call a siren server is a great big computer or set of computers that are online that are used to calculate advantages for whoever owns them. Silent servers are a new sort of a thing in the human experience. Well, I mean, of course, you can always find precedents in history, but nothing's ever been quite like this before. If you have one of the biggest or most effective computers online, you can just set up statistics to very gradually calculate some way for you to get a bit more advantage than other people, but that just continues like compound interest, so pretty soon you become rich without bounds. So here's a great example of one. Let's say you're an insurance company and you want to use big data in your big computer to decide who's really risky and who isn't risky so that you only insure the people who are less risky. Well, you know, that's a whole new game. It used to be in the old days that if you wanted to grow your insurance business, the way you did it was by signing up more people. But as soon as you can use big data to figure out who the risky ones are, then the business opportunity is to figure out who to not insure. So you do better by signing up fewer people. It's an incredible change in worldview that comes about because you have slightly better computation. And once you get that advantage, you can just start clocking in the wealth. This is exactly what's happened with big data in finance. This is what happened with long-term capital in Enron and with the mortgage debacles in the Great Recession. This is what will happen in every other industry unless we change the pattern. I love taking long drives, especially in the American West, and the idea of being able to go out on the open road and listen to Homer. Man, it's just great. I really, really like it. I imagine as cars start to drive themselves, they'll become more little entertainment houses and it might be tempted to make them much more visual. They might become like sort of rolling video games at some point. But whenever that happens, I hope we won't forget the audiobook because I think we have here a new 
medium that actually has its own charms and has its own rhythms and deserves a long life. The main thing I hope listeners will gain from my book is a sense that the way things are is not the only way they could be. I'm really sick to death of people talking about the internet and the onset of technology as if it's inevitable and anyone who doesn't like anything in particular about it is a Luddite. That's not true. It's a great big human invention. It's a great big art project of the techie class and it's steerable to a high degree. Not totally, but we really do have choices and to pretend we don't is dumb. So I hope that you'll get a sense that there's a range of possibilities. I also want to try to instill in people the notion that it's okay to think big. I'm reimagining how the world might work. And that's not something that's done all that often these days. This is an age of thinking small. This is an age where we quibble among ourselves, red against blue and that sort of thing. But really we need to think big. So even if the particular ideas in the book don't pan out or there are better ones that come along, I wanna make the point that it is okay to think from fundamentals. In fact, it's necessary.